Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Karen Faulkner and I lead developer product marketing for Square's international expansion. I'm joined today by Jason Lawler, executive director for Square Europe. And today we're going to discuss one of Square's key growth pillars, international expansion, with a particular focus on how developers can leverage that expansion to grow their business. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat function and we'll as answer as many as we can get to at the end. Um, but Jason, before we start, would you like to share a bit about your background? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Karen. And uh, hey, everyone. <clears throat> so as you mentioned, uh, I'm the executive director for Square Europe. Uh, I'm based in Ireland um, and I'm responsible for leading Square's international commercial operations, payments uh, and industry relations team, where we've got a big focus on driving international growth, uh, strategy development to support that, uh, and, and partner engagement. So prior to joining the leadership team in Square's Dublin office, uh, I worked in various roles at MasterCard, Barclays, and American Express. Um, you know, and over that career, predominantly in payments, I've seen how complex taking payments can be across the globe. Uh, and I'm very proud to be part of bringing Square's fair and transparent payment offering to businesses. You know, and speaking about why having payments integrated with business tools uh, right out of the box can be so powerful. So, yeah, really looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, let's dive in. Um, Jason, you've been involved in developing Square's international expansion program for a number of years now. Can you talk a bit about how Square has been approaching its entry to international markets? Yeah, I'd love to, Karen. So, you know, we began the journey um, to expand our products into markets outside of the US it was about nine years ago. Um, and we launched Canada in October 2012. We followed that up with a, a launch in Japan in May of 2013. Um, and then we moved uh, and launched in Australia in 2016. We followed that with a launch in the UK in 2017. Um, and so we continued to, with that kind of steady drumbeat of momentum, where 12 months ago, we strengthened our international presence again, where we launched in Ireland. Um, about 12 months ago, this time last year, actually, we followed that up with a launch in France in September of last year, and then we headed to Spain in January of this year. And, and we've absolutely got plans on the way for more markets in the near future. So from an international contribution perspective, 12% of our total gross profit comes from markets outside of the US. Uh, you know, and in addition, on an important point, we've hundreds of product partners in our app marketplace and we have a few thousand developers using our platform uh, to build solutions for sellers globally. So, look, one of the things that we focus a lot on uh, before we go into these markets is we 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 do a lot of in-depth primary research. We want to understand what our sellers, our developers, and partners want from Square. Um, and prior to launching in these markets, we we also run early access programs. We effectively want to kick the tires on the product to test and ensure that the products are the right fit for sellers uh, in these markets. Right, so it's been a busy year with launching three new markets. Um, to pick up on the point that you made earlier about research, what are some of the key learnings that you've gleaned from that research? Yeah, it's, uh, I definitely agree it's been busy, but it's been so much fun as well. And we have a great team here to make that happen. So, you know, in, a, in terms of what we've discovered, look, every market's got its own nuance. Um, and that can be related to you know specific regulatory or fiscal requirements and we see that a lot but we've seen commonality in themes as well and specifically we've seen kind of three themes that you know have arose have, have come up while we're that that are important to sellers across europe so the first is in relation to omni-channel and the need for robust omni-channel solutions right we know there's a number of competitors operating in the payments and commerce space in europe but we still heard from, from our customers, our sellers, um, there were gaps when it came to that omnichannel experience. So, you know, in order to kind of fix that, we've been working really hard to launch our full product ecosystem, you know, when we enter a new market. And that means we can offer seller, sellers anything they need to help, you know, start a business, run a business, grow a business, and indeed adapt the business. So the second thing um, I guess that we've learned is that there's an inherent dislike uh, of complex pricing structures um, and we see this complexity you know being offered by a lot of the banks in the region and we see that sellers want more flexibility when it comes to contract commitment so you know our goal here and you know we're on a purposeful kind of mission to offer fair and transparent pricing you know for our software subscriptions for our payments processing and hardware devices and 
we make a point not to sneak in added fees or lock merchants into contracts. Um, you know, so the you know, first thing is omni, the, the need for robust omni-channel solutions. The second is a need for kind of simpleness in terms of pricing structure. And I think lastly, you know, is that we found that sellers were explicitly asking for us to be integrated uh, with the other solutions they need to run their businesses. And that can include stuff like tax or accounting, as well as delivery and event booking. So in order to meet those particular needs, um, we've worked with partners, both locally and internationally, to offer sellers a full suite of tools in our app marketplace. Okay, so sellers are looking for a provider who can offer an omni-channel ecosystem flexible contracts and fair pricing, as well as access to a range of third party solutions. Yeah, exactly. Karen, like, and, you know, it's really well summarized, to be honest. So we absolutely would say yes to that. Yeah. And OK, did you find any differences then in that research um, when it comes to the payment and commerce landscape across Europe? Uh, in a word, yes. You know, if you look at, you know, specifically at e-commerce and you look at Spain, which is the third largest market in the, in Europe. Um, but despite that, only one in two people are using e-commerce regularly. So there's still kind of huge, you know, headroom or potential to grow adoption. And we've seen that kind of trend repeated in markets like France and Portugal, for example. Um, in terms of payment methods, again, I'll go back to Spain, you know, cards have been the preferred method for, for online payment, um, but that is expected to, to decline to 29% by, by 2023. Um, because what we're starting to see is, uh, you know, a share of other payment types increase. And that includes, you know, methods like digital wallets. And we're expecting digital wallets, for example, to reach 28% um, in, in 2023. So outside of that, we're, the research is also telling us that there's a big opportunity for developers uh, in those markets. You know, when I look at France, um, in our research, 40% of respondents are saying that they've used a developer to help build a direct integration to their payment provider. In Spain, the adoption is equally high at 38%. Um, you know, in terms of the vertical, the largest adoption is coming from healthcare and fitness. Um, in France, 74% uh, of sellers, payment providers enable them to integrate with third-party business tools. And that kind of stat really reinforces that this is a table stakes feature um, for sellers considering a switch to Square. Um, the last thing I'd say outside of kind of payment method and integrations is that, you know, there's a trend in buy now, pay later really starting to emerge, emerge across this region in Europe. So, you know, buy now, pay later is currently used by approximately one in five businesses across all industries, um, you know, with a further 40%, I believe, showing interest in implementation. Okay, so quite a diverse payment landscape and then varying degrees of e-commerce adoption. With that in mind, can you tell me about how, you know, how you've created the go-to-market strategy for the launch in Europe? Yeah, I mean, as I said, Square is a real fun place to work because we're, we're such a cross-functional uh, collaboration group of people here. But, you know, our, our go-to-market approach is, has been, I, I would say it's fair to say it's been quite aggressive in terms of, the large scale campaigns, um, you know, that we've launched to support, uh, you know, each country. Um, it's important to say here that a critical part of our approach is that we absolutely treat each market on its own merit. Okay, that's really important. So in Europe, for example, we understand and we respect the fact every single market is unique from a language, customs and traditions perspective. You know, and our marketing efforts are highly customized to recognize, you know, those important differences. Um, ultimately, our goal is to win in each market, you know, by having a deep understanding of what's important, um, you know, in terms of those customs uh, uh, in each country. I guess if I was to put it slightly differently, you know, we standardize our approach a as much as possible um, via our underlying infrastructure, uh, which should be border agnostic in the majority of cases. Conversely, we customize our approach via highly tailored campaigns that reflect those market by market nuances uh, I, I was chatting about earlier. Yeah. OK, so a standardized approach to infrastructure as much as possible and then customization when it comes to the launch strategy for, for each country. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Definitely. And, you know, and since we've launched, we, we rely heavily on feedback to make sure we're going in the right direction. We've had some great feedback 
um, from cellars, one seller in France, Anna Laurie, the founder of a French food and beverage company, um, has been using Square's products for on-site and online. Um, she has said, you know, her quote is that it's revolutionized how she runs her business by having an integrated uh, omni-channel payment solution, you know, which best basically means her customers can pay in any way that suits them. You know, and that's super important. Yeah, that's really, really encouraging feedback to see that coming in already. Um, and given the diversity in the European markets that you mentioned earlier, did you uncover any challenges prior to launching? Yep, <laughs> more than one is what I would say. But, uh, you know, some of the ones that I'd focus in on, I chatted earlier about, you know, our, you know, our dedication to customization. But that customization um, kind of ethos is tough. We, we now know that there's a significant volume of work involved in localizing all of our products, um, our public web pages and seller communications, you know, for every market that we enter. But having said that, although the work involved is intensive, it is a fundamental aspect of how we approach, um, you know, our go-to-market strategy. And we, we'll keep doing that. You know, it's important to us that we've accurately tailored our content and our communication to the local market uh, as, you know, we believe ultimately it's critical to, for us to get cut through on adoption. Um, outside of the customization challenge, you know, just in terms of the work intensity, you know, a key challenge in the region has been the fact that there's many very payment methods, certification and regulation, uh, regulation requirements, I should say, associated with the markets we're entering. Um, so again, prior to us launching in a given market, we do invest a lot of time and resource in developing and deepening our understanding uh, of those kind of critical areas, whether it's certification, fiscalization. And we do that because one, we need to have an accurate, accurate view um, on the work required to enter a market as that directly informs our go-to-market timelines. Mm -hmm. Equally important, I think, we want to ensure we enter a market, you know, we, we have to enter a market, I should say, in a compliant way, you know, but in the way that best serves our sellers. We, we're always striving to get that balance um, absolutely right. Yeah, okay. So clearly a lot of work goes into deciding and, and launching in these new markets. Um, why do you believe that Square's ecosystem is particularly important to European businesses right now? Um, honestly, I, 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 I don't think there's ever been a better time for, for Square to launch our omni-channel um, ecosystem of products uh, across Europe. You know, um, brick and mortar retailers have had a tough time. They've faced, you know, unprecedented challenges throughout 2020 and again in 2021. You know, and a lot of those businesses have had to close their doors for over well over half a year. But even when those doors are open, there's there have been kind of remaining limitations on the type of in-store experience that they've been able to provide their customers. So on the other hand, e-commerce has flourished uh, with consumers choosing to spend more online, <clears throat> excuse me, even when restrictions have been lifted, you know, and. We, we rely a lot on data. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we're looking at data recently from the UK e-commerce association and that that stated that total online sales in the UK grew, you know, by a massive 36% in 2020. So I kind of feel we've got a unique advantage over, over many of our comp competition with the, with the depth of our omni-channel products. Um, you know, and again, I'll bring it back to the point on feedback and, Kind of making sure we're pointed in the right direction using that in-market feedback and we've heard that sentiment uh, echoed by a number of our developers in europe um, who have started building with, with square api so you know for example sylvian's a developer and, he, and he's the founder of board game geeks which is an online and in-person retailer you know who, who has said that he changed from zettel to square because we're the only company in france who seamlessly integrated pause on online inventory so um you know Let's hope we continue in that way. The sentiment uh, and the feedback suggests that, that we're doing the right thing here. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a it's a great endorsement of our omni-channel APIs um, and great to see developers already starting to use them in these new markets. Um, switching gears for a second, why do you think it's important for, you know, not just Square, but all businesses uh, to be considering international expansion? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, I, there's there's a load of reasons 
you know, for, for, for companies to be considering international expansion. But I, a few things spring to mind. Like, I mean, once an e-commerce company or a business model is successful in its home market, there's kind of two forces that are going to drive that company to expand internationally, um, you know, pretty quickly. The first is is consumer demand, um, and that's going to drive the company into international markets, I feel. You know, due to the interconnectivity of the world we live in, you know, it's due to, like, just that massive proliferation of, of distribution platforms like App Store, Facebook, and Twitter, right? So that consumer demand uh, is, is ever-present, and that should be a catalyst for that kind of springing into new markets. The second force um, that has emerged is that, I feel that entrepreneurs and developers in other markets will now quickly adopt successful models to their own markets before the originators of those models are able to expand. So I just think it's wise to have international expansion at the top of your commercial strategy and your investment plan. So, you know, you can move quickly, you can realize the full benefit of the potential that exists in markets outside of your home country. So like there's a couple of reasons it's consumer demand and, and it's also, um, you know, just keeping it, top of your agenda really are a couple of the points not the only things of course but yeah yeah it makes sense and i suppose you've given some examples of advice there already but um in general is there any other advice that you'd give to startups or businesses that are thinking about expanding internationally um yes for sure um i think that the first point i'd say is kind of linked to my last point about planning for international expansion you know Plan for success, you know, prepare for international expansion from the start. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to build, you know, in multi-language support or undertake a, a huge amount of work on international expansion from the very beginning. But do think about building infrastructure and choosing partners that can help you expand and don't make it too difficult down the line. So, you know, get some of the fundamentals um, worked out early, particularly as it relates to infrastructure and partnerships. Um, I also think you've got to consider your target markets really carefully. Um, research the countries that have strong demand for your products or a new speciality. Um, we mentioned payments previously. I, I think you'd have to start thinking about how you'll accept payments and what's the best for the markets in, in, in which you're going to sell. Um, that's a really important point because checkout now is the point at which international shoppers tend to abandon their purchases. And we know from experience here that payment types can vary different, very significantly depending on the country. And Germany, for example, you know, in, in people there are making 46% of payments by online bank transfer. Okay, so it's very specific to that market. Um, you know, outside of planning for international expansion from the start and payment methods, um, I'd also say it's really important to understand how your market operates, you know, your target market. You know, we found that in France, it's a highly omni-channel market with 76% of merchants selling their goods and services, both in person and remotely. So if your model is business to business, it's really important to ensure that your product or service can, you know, easily be incorporated into all sales channels. Yeah, okay. So it's important to focus on researching your target audience in those geos. Um, and how they operate, as well as the payment methods they take. So that actually leads me on to my next question. What opportunities do you think expanding internationally with Square unlocks for developers? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's worth noting that Square's developer platform is available in every market that Square is launched in, you know, and so that platform offers developers a really rich and comprehensive set of APIs and SDKs which are aimed at enabling them to build applications custom made for their specific business needs. Um, you know, developers can build innovative commerce applications um, that will enhance Square's offering and publish them on Square's app marketplace. Um, I think the second thing I'd say it's, is that our relationship with partners is a hugely important and value, valued aspect of our new country expansion program. So as we go into new markets, we're always working really closely with our partners in the lead up to and right the way during launch to ensure that, you know, we have that comprehensive suite of products just to service all sellers. So 
honestly, the principle here, I guess the sentiment is that our partners complement Square's ecosystem and vice versa. And we've heard really positive feedback from partners who have expanded into new markets with us. And we're obviously delighted to have partners like WooCommerce and Wix and Deliverect, you know, amongst the many who have expanded with us. Um, interestingly, you know, and significantly, I, I think we've, we've seen a number of developers like Musicians League um, who begin who have begun building on Square's APIs in the US, but now have expanded to the UK and France. So it's been really exciting as well to see um, lots of local integration partners building to Square. And recently we've seen Holded, uh, a tax and accountancy partner in Spain, and Food Detective, a restaurant booking platform um, in, in France. Um, so that's been excellent to see. Um, the last thing I'd say is that you know, we've heard feedback from developers and partners that they don't want to build integrations with new payment providers every time they expand into a market. I actually think that's the critical point, you know, as we expand, um, our developers and partners expand. So, you know, basically that expansion enables our partners, you know, who are working with Square just to easily unlock access to huge global markets, like in France, where there's over 4 million small and medium sized businesses or Spain, um, with two and a half million uh, small businesses. So the opportunity there is huge. Yeah, I, I definitely echo the sentiment that you made earlier as well about how important it is to work closely with um, developers and our partners as we expand, expand globally. I think that Square can learn a lot from our partners. Um, and I think equally, it's clear that there are a lot of opportunities for partner growth by joining Square in that expansion too. Yeah, I, I think that... Um, as I mentioned earlier, like we're taking a really aggressive approach to launching in Europe and with heavy investment in driving awareness. And, and, you know, we're encouraging developers and partners to join us, come on that journey, be part of that growth and hopefully capture the opportunity together. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Um, we've had some questions come in on the chat. And um, so we'll go to those next. Um, I'll go to this first question. Um, can you give a concrete example of customs differences in a country or two that applies to your strategy? Um, yeah, I, I, it's a great question. Um, sometimes it's just very subtle. Um, I'll give you an example. I'm, if you haven't worked it out already, I'm Irish. And, you know, it's, it, it's when we were launching in Ireland, we wanted to make sure that our local copy, or, you know, our, our marketing editorial, represent how Irish people would would speak and consume messages, right? And so whilst we had a base in the UK, we had a really strong localization expert turning what I call UK English into Irish English. Um, and that's a real subtle but massively important thing, right? And, you know, we don't live in the United States of Europe. Um, and and our, our mission here is to ensure that when we do enter a market, we've been massively respectful and mindful of that. And, I'll bring it back to the point I made earlier about, um, you know, localization being such a huge part of what we what we do. But we see that in every market, by the way. I've just given that one because it's it one it's one that resonates largely with me. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Um, the next question that came in was, where will Square launch next, and are you planning any additional European expansion? Um, I can't tell you where we're going to launch next right now. We're still working it out, but I can say that we are absolutely planning um, more international expansion. Like globalization is one of our key goals here at Square. Um, we have an awesome team around the world uh, geared towards achieving that goal. We know how important it is. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're going to continue with a steady, steady drumbeat of momentum. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, we've got a couple more questions here, but we're almost at time. So we'll try and get to another one of them. And if we don't get to all of them, we will um, definitely make sure to, to come back and, and follow up with um, everybody individually on these. Um, the next question, just taking it in order, uh, on regulation, is there a concrete example of some interesting regulations that Square is working within in a location in Europe? Um, um, I'm going to answer that by talking about regulation and kind of what we call fiscalization requirements. So, you know, we um, 
in order for us to do our business in Europe, we have permission from the regulator, the Central Bank of Ireland in Ireland, to, to effectively passport into Europe. And um, there are many uh, areas of compliance that we need to adhere to to ensure that we're acting within the permissions that's granted. Um, so, you know, those regulations can stem from anything from, you know, how we're conducting our anti-money laundering practices um, right the way through to how we onboard our customers, right? Um, I think what's kind of more in kind of almost nuanced is what I would call fiscalization requirements. I just can't think of a better name for it, but effectively when you go to um, France, for example, th there may be a receipt type that you need to present at point of sale that looks slightly different from the one that you have to do in Spain, right? And so you have to be very aware of those apparently subtle, but can be massively impactful kind of um, differences. So yeah, uh, you know, we're always aware of, of regulation and, and keep a very close eye on changing regulatory requirements, but equally very keyed into some of the local market requirements that are very unique to each market. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Um, there are some other questions coming in. Um, does Square have a dedicated currency converter or app functionality for online or mobile so international customers are reaching out with currency conversions and it can be somewhat daunting um in terms of the currency converter i'll need to come back um on that one so let me let me take that away and um, because i think it's come up in another one of the questions as well so we will uh, grab that question and, and circle back with you on on when we think we'll have functionality like that um another question are Square more driven towards their traditional SME clients in Europe, or are they looking to increase their market offering for enterprise clients? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, that's a great question, right? And it's, I think it's unfortunately probably going to be the last one that we can get to. But what I would say is that if you go back in time, um, Square started life as a in-person payments company. Um, and, you know, we were initially set up to serve that micro seller, you know, that kind of one person, small business, um, usually, you know, and, and that was the kind of the, 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 the kind of genesis of our business. Today, we've evolved to what I would call a, an omni-channel commerce company, um, you know, who, who operates across the, uh, who, we've invested so heavily in our software offering, which has kind of allowed us to develop this integrated ecosystem across the omni-channel and that integrated integrated ecosystem is now serving sellers of all types and sizes you know we continue to serve and continue to work with the micro sellers but we're also working um with with sellers who have uh multi locations so you know as as our sellers have grown we've grown with them Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, apologies. I know we didn't get to a few questions, but as I mentioned, we will uh, do our best to, to get answers and, and create an FAQ doc with any of the questions that we missed. Thank you all for your time and thank you for joining us. We look forward to hopefully working with more of you in Europe as we continue to expand. Thank you. Thank you.